So can I call the, the board to order um, and just welcome everybody. Um, let me just start with the apologies. So we've, ha we've got apologies um, today from, um, from Mary Watkins and from Andrew Morris and actually Jeremy Townsend um, and Robert Leckler, who were with us this morning in the, in, in the private board session, uh, are unable to um, join us this afternoon. Can I ask um, members to declare any additional conflicts of interest that may have arisen since we last met? Are there any declarations of interest? Thank you. Um, and then can I ask for the board's approval to the minutes of the meeting we held on the 1st of February? Yes. Okay, so, okay, so we'll adopt the minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just um, give a few comments by way of um, chair's update before um, I, I hand over to, to the chief executive. Um, I mean, clearly since we last met seven weeks or so ago, we've had um, the budget and very recently, really very recently, clearly we've now issued um, planning guidance within that budget. Um, uh, clearly there was a very um, helpful, um, committed investment coming from the government, from the Chancellor, um, attaching to technology, 3.4 billion. Um, and that was a really welcome, I think, um, injection into our technology um, investment portfolio, which will help us, I think, um, not just on things like the app, and we've talked about that um, this morning, but also in terms of efficiency and productivity and investment in underlying underlying systems. So, I mean, really, really good. Um, we also had the, yesterday the Attitudes um, survey published, and I'd like to talk about that um, in a moment. Um, can I just share some of the visits and the events and, and meetings that I've, I've engaged upon since we last met? Um, so I did a very um, good, actually, um, ambulance shift with the London Ambulance Service, and, and I'm very grateful to them, um, actually, for for the whole day, actually. Um, so there was quite a lot of time actually spent in the centre and in the call centre and listening into calls, um, but also actually going out um, on a shift, um, which, again, um, and actually Chris Hobson, actually, in an interview a couple of mornings ago or yesterday morning, referenced a very similar um, experience. Whenever I do go out um, with an ambulance crew, um, it is both humbling, but also just a remarkable, it's humbling as a, for me to see, but it's a remarkable experience to see how well our ambulance crews engage in really quite difficult, obviously quite difficult um, interventions. And they do that with sort of courage and passion and, and humor sometimes, but actually um, just their sheer professionalism and it, it, it's always a really rather remarkable um, reminder to me of, um, of the, the privilege of this job, actually, to, to engage with the front line and, and to see them in action. Um, I had a very good visit to the Royal Marsden, um, focused predominantly on genomics, and that was, that was, ex that was excellent to look at things like liquid biopsy, um, which was, again, um, really interesting to see that and the level of research they have um, underway in, in that trust. And last night at dinner, of course, we had the chair of the Royal Marsden join us, actually, and, and that was a good conversation um, that was um, held by him and, 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 and other guests with the board. I visited the Leeds Teaching Hospital, um, where um, I went and, and saw the pressures on A&E. I also saw the chemotherapy unit and had the opportunity to engage with uh, a number of patients, actually. Um, undertaking or undergoing um, chemotherapy. I went to an innovation pop-up, and that was really quite interesting to see actually med tech in action, and actually lots of small private businesses suggesting and, and, and creating um, potential med tech in, um, interventions um, for adoption. And then I went over um, and met with the West Yorkshire ICB, um, hosted by Cathy Elliott, the um, CEO of the, um, of, of the ICB there, and we had a primary care round table with system leaders um, and community partnership um, uh, volunteers um, and actually a really very, very good um, conversation. Um, a lot of pressure on that system, um, but actually, again, it's always rather remarkable um, for me. And I see the enthusiasm of the frontline engaging with really, really um, testing, uh, testing challenges. In events, Jackie is here. Um, we had a, a, a very good suppliers forum in Leeds. Um, uh, with Jackie bringing together um, our leading suppliers to the NHS. I had, the, the, again, the privilege of being able to make the opening um, presentation to that. It was a really good um, engagement, a really good conference, and actually in, in particular talking about the new procurement framework 
um, which comes into play, I think, in the autumn of this year, and actually is a very, it's a very radical, a, a very significant increase and improvement in the way that we will be able to give effect to um, procure, better procurement. We had our first chairs event for ICB chairs and trust chairs, and we brought leaders from across the system. We had a, a, sort of an over 90 per cent um, turnout rate, which was really, really good, and we were able to um, discuss in some detail and do breakout groups around, around challenges of system working, but also actually what had been actually a really quite effective management of, uh, of winter, um, which partly was con part of that success coming actually from the success of good system, systems working. Um, with Amanda and um, with, with Simon Wesley, we, we went and had dinner with the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Again, that was very generous and kind of them um, to host us. And we had a really, I think, good and strong conversation around what we're seeing in, in mental health. And today we've got a paper actually on, on ADHD coming um, later on to this board. But again, a very rich um, conversation with the, with, with the Royal College. Um, and I also attended, as in Amanda, um, the NHS Assembly about 10 days or so ago, where we each did separate um, Q&As and discussion, um, and particularly actually um, just focus upon how we come through winter, the steps that we've taken through the winter to get to the, the levels of performance that we've seen, and then looking forward into current levels, levels of challenge. Um, there was, they had a very good and separate conversation around patient safety, um, and also separately around innovation, uh, again, across, across the health service. In terms of other meetings, um, yesterday with, um, with Vin uh, and with John Quinn, our CIO, we were doing interviews for the new chair of the Cyber um, Security and Risk Committee, and we saw a number of candidates, good candidates, actually, and I think we will be able to make a, a good and strong appointment. Um, we had the board deep dive to remind you on AI, uh, and that was, again, a very good day with some very good external speakers, um, really knowledgeable in the space, operating in the space, and actually it does have the ability to offer radical transformation, actually in many aspects of our lives, and potentially clearly also to, um, to the health service. We've done two stakeholder breakfasts on the topic of capital and the estate, and were uh, chaired by Chris Hobson, um, and actually that brings people from across the various systems together. And we had, again, very good conversations about um, challenges of capital. Um, and the second one in particular focused more on primary care estate and actually what the options and what the opportunities are um, to engage with that, with that topic. Um, I've chaired an NHS England genomics board. Um, again, it's the second of those boards in a, a, reconstituted, um, a reconstituted board. And again, we had very good conversations there, predominantly around data, um, around um, genomic sequencing backlog, um, uh, and on cancer, actually. So a focus, actually, on genomic, genomics um, treatments for, uh, for cancer. I'd just like to thank, then, the board, um, because, actually, since we last met, all of the committees have operated. It's often um, not understood that below the, the board that's here evident today, we have a range of committees, and these committees work hugely hard. If we think that um, we have brought together um, NHS Improvement, NHS Digital, NHSX, and HEE, and actually, I think, David, you, you reminded us this morning, actually, that if we think about the HEE board, it used to actually run essentially 40 meetings in a year to cover the breadth of the agenda, and now, of course, that is, that is now predominantly covered through one of our committees. Um, which is um, the Workforce Talent um, and Education um, Committee. But so the Audit and Risk Committee has met, the Quality Committee has met twice, um, the Workforce um, Talent and Education Committee has met, Data Digital and Technology Committee has met, the CFO Advisory Group has also met, and then under, well, under your chairmanship, we've had, I think, probably the penultimate, the penultimate of the um, the, com the new NHS England committees, which of course is the committee that has overseen the merger of these five entities and actually bringing together the workforce of the 24,000 workforce originally and the reduction in that workforce to by around um, 35, 30, 36%. But more importantly, making sure that the head office organisations now combined as one continues to perform actually without missing a beat. Um, I said earlier on I would just comment on the social attitude survey. We've all seen that. Um, public opinion is really clear. I mean, it is, 
clearly it's helpful that there's huge support for the foundational principles of the NHS, but we have to also recognise actually that um, the public, um, there's, a, there's a further decline in the public confidence in the performance of the NHS, and we need to reflect upon that. Um, I'm not at all, at all going to be Pollyanna-ish. I clearly recognise that um, public perception, but I would like to say that um, the NHS today is providing record levels of healthcare intervention, um, and that's been provided by a workforce um, under very real pressure and working hugely hard actually to provide those record levels of healthcare um, intervention. And whether it's the fact that um, more than one in 10 of the population in England has a primary care appointment every single week. I realise access is a major issue. We've got to do better at how we provide access. But in primary care, more than one in 10 of the population has an appointment every single week. And almost half of those, it's about 48%, but don't quote me on that number, but is, I think it is the right number. So almost half of those appointments are on the day that the individual patient or, or citizen asks for the appointment. And it's about 70% of these appointments are physical appointments and, and around a third or just under a third are virtual or telephony, um, telephony appointments, you know, callbacks on, on tests, blood tests, etc. Um, but I think it's... Um, we shouldn't lose sight, actually, just of the sheer scale of provision. At the same time, we have to recognise that the public has, has in that survey, expressed um, concern around, around performance. The other thing I often um, like to share, which I learn actually from all of you, but also in particular from Amanda, is actually it's not just the scale of the intervention, it's the level of in innovation that, uh, that we have um, and we demonstrate all the time in the NHS. And I did a, an event actually at Deloitte's Academy um, two mornings ago on productivity, and I did that with uh, May Lee, who's our Director of, of Efficiency. And again, one of the things that came up was the topic of innovation. And the ability to talk about our genomics activity, to talk about um, that rather amazing announcement of last week on ctDNA for lung cancer, which actually removes the need or reduces the need for endoscopy and allows blood tests to identify, um, identify that cancer and then to intervene much more quickly, whether it's cytosponges, whether in technology it's the, um, it's the NHS app, which continues with huge support from the Department of Health actually to conti it continues to improve and to add functionality all the time and to see significant take up um, from the population. And all of us, I think, would agree that if you look at the NHS app, um, it is um, going to continue to transform, if not revolutionise, the way that we offer um, health care, health intervention um, to, to, to the public. But the, the social attitude survey is, is makes for um, very sobering reading, and we have to clearly reflect on that, but then continue with our workforce to continue to provide this level of care. I'd just like to talk very briefly, if I might, on, on industrial action. And I would say, let me link that, first of all, to elective backlog and, uh, and waiting lists. Um, through the work of the NHS staff, there is continued progress, good progress on the longest waits for patients. And this month's data showed that the COVID backlog um, fell for the, the fourth um, consecutive month. But when you think about the impact of industrial action and also a busy winter period, um, I think the progress has been good that for four months running, we've seen a fall um, in, that, in that waiting list. And that is um, thanks to the hugely hard work of the front line and also the planning and the engagement with that topic by a number of our, our leaders. However, the BMA did announce this month that they're going to extend their mandate for further industrial action, which obviously is a concern for all of us. And it, will, it does make it harder to continue positive traje trajectory on the electives. Um, an estimated 430,000 fewer treatments um, were delivered due to the industrial action since it began in December 22. And actually, the industrial action has had a particular impact on our ambition to bring down the longest waits. So 157,000 fewer treatments by the end of March um, 
uh, for patients to avoid waiting for more than 65 weeks. So their, pay, their treatments were delayed, 157,000 who might otherwise, I think, um, have actually then um, been treated in that, uh, in that particular cohort in, in the electives or in the waiting lists would have then been reduced. So we're seeing real delay actually because of industrial action in, in the treatment of patients. Um, I just say planning guidance, so I think Amanda's probably going to um, comment more on, on the planning guidance. It was published, I think, late yesterday, yeah. um, and it sets out the prior priorities for next year, and I know that, um, that we will be continuing to discuss those. Not Well, we discussed them this morning, and we'll continue to discuss those a little bit through this meeting, but also in, in future meetings. So that's all I think I'm going to say by way of um, introduction, apart from um, we intend to announce um, next week um, something we'd flagged earlier when, when a number of our new colleagues um, who have joined us on the board um, were announced. So we've, we've had four new directors have joined us, but actually we intend to announce two associate non-executive directors in the course of next week, um, one of whom very able in the world of um, workforce and talent and, and training and development, and the other, again, um, very expert in the world of actually l large retail technology systems, legacy systems, and cloud. So I'm, I'll be delighted when we can make that announcement, and they will then join us, I think, for the next, for the next board. Amanda, right. over to you. Richard, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, so. Uh, I'm going to, I will att attempt not to duplicate what Richard said, but we will just touch on some of the same things because I want to build Sorry. on some of them. No, 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 completely, completely right. Uh, but just to, to go a little bit deeper, I think, particularly on planning guidance, if, uh, if that's OK. Um, but just to say, of course, um, since we were last together as a board, we have heard the Chancellor's um, spring budget, and that contained some quite... Big news for the NHS. So in the current climate, an extra 2.45 billion of funding for next year is very welcome. It does allow us to go into 24-25 with a flat real financial position. So whilst uh, it will still be a very financially challenging year, I think it means that we clearly need to continue to make sure that we are spending every penny wisely, wringing out the maximum benefit for patients. And it also means, though, that we can keep making progress on the priorities that matter most for patients. And I'll say a bit more about that in relation to planning guidance in a moment. The other big announcement for us in the spring budget was the very significant capital investment, you already mentioned it, Richard, of $3.4 billion in technology and data starting from 25-26. That is really positive news, so it will allow us to roll out our tech and digital services to improve access, waiting times and outcomes, and has the potential, I would honestly say this, to be genuinely transformational for patients and for our staff. So we'll hear shortly, I think, from Julian a little bit more on the wider implications of the budget. And I think in due course, we will come back, uh, I'm sure, many times to talking about the bigger tech digital data opportunities. Um, on planning guidance, so as Richard has just said, colleagues will know that that was issued uh, yesterday evening. So I think we would obviously acknowledge that that was somewhat later than usual. Some of that was, though, because uh, a lot of the... Uh, things I've just mentioned in the budget were very material to being able to land the detail that was then set out in planning guidance yesterday. Um, what hopefully it does mean for colleagues around the room, plus anybody who is listening in, is there aren't many, if any, surprises in the planning guidance. Uh, however, saying that, it is a vital piece of work and it's a really important document because it does offer a clear articulation of our collective ambition and the ambition we have agreed with government over the next 12 months. And it also shows a clear, a continued direction of travel. It also, because it's an annual thing, gives us a chance to look back at the year that we have just concluded, or what we are just about to conclude. Um, and I think, as Richard has said, um, it does allow us to highlight some of the things that, sort of, despite the challenges, we can be collectively really proud of. So over the past year, NHS teams have made significant progress delivering key priorities for patients in the face of, and we've just touched on it, but strong headwinds from industrial action, 
increased demand, the ongoing effects of the pandemic and inflationary pressures. We've seen, and uh, Emily's talked about this before, but we've seen uh, real progress against almost every headline objective from last year, whether that's urgent emergency care, primary care, mental health inequalities, elective and cancer care, or technology and innovation. And what's really clear as you look back at uh, the year that's just finished is all of that has taken careful planning, hard work, and enormous ingenuity. And that is all thanks to the commitment, the, ad the adaptability, and the professionalism of staff all across the NHS. So that, I think, is... I'll come back to say a bit more about that in a, mo in a moment. But that is worthy, I think, of note, set against the fact that, of course, what planning guidance sets out is the next steps in progress on all of those things and where we need to go next to continue that journey. The other thing that planning guidance sets out um, is, again, I think, building on what I've just said about the spring budget, uh, but the fact that we are putting in place some of the building blocks for the future. So that investment in technology, the NHS long-term workforce plan that was published last summer, um, and actually the increasingly mature partnerships at ICP, ICB and place level. But we do know that that is not the totality of what is needed to ensure the NHS is better able to meet, and, uh, meet our patients' needs in the future. Uh, we've talked about it before, but with an ageing population and more patients with complex needs, the NHS and our partners you know, are going to need to adapt, Richard, you've just said it, if we're going to help people live longer, healthier lives. So as set out in the long-term workforce plan, what that will mean is further investment in estates and in social care. And crucially, we will also need a coordinated, ambitious approach to prevention. But we do have a base on which to plan service improvement over the medium term. And I know I speak for all my colleagues when I say we are now really looking forward to working with colleagues in the NHS on that over the coming months. This year's planning guidance, last couple of things on this before I move on, um, does also set out the things that we know can make a big difference to the working lives of our colleagues, including things like increasing choice and flexibility in rotors and stronger actual action on sexual safety. Again, both things we've talked about before. Uh, but as we say in planning guidance, those things should be seen as the floor rather than the ceiling <coughs> of our collective ambition to be a better and more responsive employer. Uh, so enough on planning guidance. I know we're going to say more about it as the meeting goes on. Um, Richard, you've talked about the British Social Attitudes Survey, and yeah. I think I just wanted to uh, make sure that I'd, I'd sort of added my voice to yours on this, because clearly the findings do make difficult reading, and they do reflect the sustained pressure facing our services, particularly when the survey took place back in the autumn. Um, but they're also a reminder that we are very much still recovering from the pandemic, whilst also dealing with all the knock-on impacts of industrial action and the other headwinds I've talked about. Um, and whilst it is always welcome to see that the public overwhelmingly continue to back the founding principles of the NHS, and it is also true that our recovery plans are improving access and helping the NHS to deliver year-on-year -year improvements for patients, this must act as just a really important insight for everyone working in the NHS on how the public currently feel about our services and it is a timely reminder of how much hard work is ahead and while we continue to make progress on all of our recovery plans um, we know there is still a long way to go. Um, I'm going to move on if mm -hmm. I may. a few other yep. things to talk about. Uh, so um, because I know uh, we've talked about this in various forums but not as a board um, I did want to just take this opportunity to say that I uh, I know, again, I speak for many of us, all of us, I'm sure, to say how sorry I was to hear the Princess of Wales's news about her cancer diagnosis. Um, and I think it's probably a reminder that receiving a cancer diagnosis at any time can be hugely daunting. But by bravely speaking out in the way that the Princess of Wales has done about her diagnosis, um, we know that that will, in fact it already has, encouraged others to do the same and by the simple act of raising awareness that will save lives. So we've seen cancer information pages on the NHS website uh, have had a huge spike 
in visits since the princess's video message. I can tell you, just checking the stats, there were 2,840 visits to the page on cancer in the 24 hours after the announcement. That is a rise of 373% just over that 24-hour period. Um, so we know, uh, we talk about it a lot at this board, that the earlier that you can detect uh, cancer, the better, because the earlier that can be diagnosed means um, you have a higher chance of successful treatment. And so whilst we are diagnosing early stage cancer at, you know, uh, at, at record uh, well, we're, we're diagnosing more cancers to get it really precise at an earlier stage than ever, and survival rates are at an all-time high. We do want to continue to encourage people to come forward uh, when they are concerned about symptoms, not wait. So anyone with unusual or worrying symptoms should visit their GP, and uh, it's just, a, again, a reminder of how important it is to take up screening appointments when offered. Um, Richard, I'm going to finish, if I may, with just a bit more of a look back. Um, so it's one of the things that we, uh, I've just talked about, that we did as part of planning guidance. And you're right to say, uh, Richard, and you always remind us of this, not to be Pollyanna-ish, not to sound like we haven't noticed the level of pressure on our staff or indeed some of the challenges that our patients are facing. However... I did a visit last oh, a couple of weeks ago now, maybe three weeks ago, uh, which was just, again, a really timely reminder of, of despite some of those pressures, how much progress yeah. is being made. So I visited the National Problem Gambling Clinic in London. Now, five years ago, that was the only clinic providing specialised treatment for people with gambling addictions. Now, uh, we've just opened our 15th clinic in Sheffield, and that meets the NHS long-term plan target. But it's just one of those things that might not always get the front pages, but actually it's really important progress for those patients. Um, and it's, a, I think, again, um, just a, a moment to say, we said we would do something, we've done it, we already know what a big difference that's making. So if I just look back at the previous year for a moment, so uh, we said we would open 5,000 additional core beds, GNA beds. Uh, we said we'd have them open in January, and we did. And that, along with more ambulance hours on the road, uh, greater use of urgent community response and emission avoidance services, increasingly mature discharge hubs, and over 11,000 virtual ward beds has made a real difference to urgent emergency care flow. I've said it in planning guidance, but it is worth noting that for the first time since 2009, apart from that very first year of the COVID pandemic, four-hour A&E performance has improved. And actually, over the years, so it's an average, Category 2 ambulance response times reduced this year by 17 minutes. In mental health, we've expanded services with four in ten schools now having access to mental health support teams and more people than ever before in contact with NHS services for support for their mental health, autism and or learning disabilities. We've had record numbers of uh, people coming forward and being checked and treated for cancer and thanks to initiatives like our targeted lung health checks we're now diagnosing as i said a moment ago more cancers at stage one and stage two when cancer is easier to treat you've mentioned industrial action and the impact it's had on elective care richard but despite that long waits for elective care have reduced and we've done over the course of this year uh, 17.3 million elective pathways have been completed uh, that uh, is in 2023. That's an increase of over 1.3 million treatments compared to the year before. And that is despite the disruption of industrial action, which uh, would have allowed us to do even more. Uh, we've seen nearly 20 million more appointments in primary care than last year. And that means, as Richard uh, often says, uh, you've given your one in 10 of the population. I'm going to do my 1.4 million people every working day with an appointment in primary care. We've also launched uh, new initiatives like Pharmacy First, uh, and we've also published the Dental Recovery Plan, all of which are designed to make it easier for patients to access care when they need it. And alongside all of that, we've continued to develop and uh, to adopt new and innovative treatments, whether that's liquid biopsy testing for patients with suspected lung cancer, or it's the rollout of the latest diabetes technology to provide tens of thousands of people with life-changing devices to manage their condition. So I'll just finish by saying, 
we are not alone as an NHS. In fact, it is completely in common with advanced healthcare across, uh, systems across the world. We are all of us facing major challenges in recovering services and meeting the growing needs of an ageing population. But this year, the NHS has once again shown that it can rise to the challenge and real improvement is possible even in the toughest of circumstances. So I'd like to finish uh, my remarks by just saying an enormous thank you to staff across the NHS for everything you have done in the past 12 months for our patients. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm not going to pause at the moment for sort of um, board comments on anything either that I've said or Amanda has said. What I'd like to do is just carry on that narrative actually around performance. And Emily, if I can ask you to um, give us an update on, on operational performance, and then Julian, if that's right, I'll come to you for financial performance. <coughs> Emily. Thank you. Um, so there are two papers that show the performance um, until the most recent published data at the end of January, some data published in February. Um, and I'm going to try and pick out a few aspects of that to draw people's attention to. Um, <coughs> In terms of the, the Pollyanna challenge, uh, I, I like to think of it as an and, in that I hope what I say and what the paper presents represents really extraordinary efforts by NHS staff across the board and in several places much further to go. Um, and I want to make sure we recognise both. Um, I think the data provides clear evidence of some of the challenges we've been facing. And we've been able to face them because of that professionalism that all NHS staff have shown, particularly across winter and across periods of industrial action, to ensure we're providing the best possible care for patients. So on you start with UEC, um, pressures remained high during February with five days of industrial action by junior doctors and high levels of demand compared to the previous year in particular. Um, in February 24, just to give you a sense of the scale, we saw record levels of A&E attendance, almost 9% higher than February 23, and ambulance services answering 12% more calls to 999 than February 23. Emergency admissions have also been increasing and have been up 7%, 10%, and 12% in each of the last three months compared to the previous year. We had, instead of a sharp, um, very high flu peak, as in the winter of 22-23, um, an ongoing flu peak that was lower at its peak but went on for much longer. Um, hospitals had, on average, more than 2,000 flu patients in hospital beds during February compared to 700 in February 23. <coughs> Despite this, the systems have been able to deliver four-hour performance improvements month on month since December. Um, it was at 70.9% in February compared to 70.3% in January. Category 2 performance was at 36 minutes 20 seconds in February, which is an improvement of over three minutes on the previous month. Um, this is in part a reflection on the significant amount of effort and resource that staff invested in preparing for and managing industrial action and in recovering from that afterwards. Um, a significant amount of work was done to prepare for the winter period. Amanda's already mentioned the, both the core bed commitment and the new virtual war beds. Um, so just to put the, the icing on that cake, um, we delivered in January at the, um, the first hitting the target of the um, 99,500 core beds, um, and we've maintained that average. So the average was 99,765 core beds in place each day. Um, and the 10,000 virtual ward, ward bed target was delivered ahead of time, and in February that was 11,918 virtual ward beds. So what we've been working on with the UEC team in, and with systems and with our clinical leaders is to figure out how do we um, consolidate, maintain and improve that um, performance that we've seen, the performance improvement we've seen in UEC. We're moving into year two of the UEC recovery plan. We want to sustain the improvements we made and go further. So that includes adjusting areas of focus to ensure that patients get the best possible care as we notice what's happening in response to the existing targets. So, for example, I'm sure people will have noticed that in planning guidance, we've asked systems to reduce the proportion of weights over 12 hours in A&E compared to 23, 24, which is a clinically critical target for patients. If we turn now to elective, um, despite the impact of industrial action, which you've both mentioned, and just to put a sort of 
baseline on that, we've seen more than one in 10 days impacted by strike action in the past year. We are seeing continued progress being made to reduce long waits with month on month decreases seen in the total waiting list since September 23, um, with a further decrease seen in January 24. Um, I won't read through the numbers which are in the pack for the, in the interest of time, but um, if we just compare that to where we were when the elective plan was first developed in January 22, 78 week waits have reduced from 78,000 to 14,000, um, and 65 week waits have uh, on the way to halving from 163,000 to 92,000. And overall, our data shows the total waiting list has reduced for four consecutive months um, from August to January 24, which is the first time we've seen consecutive reductions since September 2017. So none of that happens without extraordinary levels of coordinated work across systems and concern at the clinical level for individual patient groups. Um, what we've learned from all of that work, both in UEC, in elective and in cancer, which I'll come to in a second, is that those headline measures both involve good progress across the board and some improvements that every system has made um, to make things better for patients and in other places where there is a specific challenge in an individual system. So, for example, the point we're at now with 78 week waits, which is sort of six weeks post the published data, which is in the paper, um, is we can see that the challenges are in a specific group of trusts. So, for example, on 78 week waits, the top 13 providers nationally account for over 50% of the national volume. And within that, there are specific specialties that are challenging in individual systems. So, if I turn now to cancer, it, just like the other two areas I've mentioned, we're seeing an ongoing high level of demand. So the number of urgent suspected cancer referrals first seen is over 128% of pre-pandemic levels. Um, and within that, systems have been able to deliver. So performance against the 75% faster diagnostic standard was 70.9%, which is 4% four percentage points higher than January um, 23, which continues the trend to performance being significantly higher every month, year on year. On diagnostics, our published statistics show we're delivering record diagnostic activity. It's 113% above pre-pandemic levels, and each month in 23-24 saw higher activity than the same month in any previous year, including 2.34 million diagnostic events in January 24. I also wanted to make sure we spoke about mental health, which is an important strand of our national commitments and where there is also incredibly high demand. There were 116,561 referrals to community crisis in January 24, which is an 11% increase on January 23. The mental health UEC pathway bed occupancy remains very high with an average length of stay at 46 days nationally as of December 23. And we still have very high out of area placements because of that high bed occupancy. There are places in mental health where we can really see the and that I mentioned coming together. So although in many places we haven't hit the target we were aiming for, we are close and can see it's within reach. Um, and we need to support systems to deliver that this year. So, for example, the dementia diagnosis rate is at 64.4% as of January 24, against a target of 66.7% or an ambition, sorry, which is demonstrating steady improvement since January 23. If we can maintain the existing trajectory, we would hope to deliver the ambition in 24-25. Mm. The mental health UEC pathway bed occupancy, as I mentioned, remains high, um, and there is more work to do to make sure those beds are in the right place when patients need them, including reducing the 46-day length of stay. Children and young people accessing services continues to increase with 758,485 children and young people accessing services in the 12 months to January 24. That's against a target of 840,254 so although we're behind trajectory, access rates are improving um, and the systems are putting plans in place to make sure we can reach that ambition. Access to specialist community perinatal mental health and maternal mental health services also continues to increase. In the 12 months to January 24, 55,873 women accessed these services against a 23-24 target of 66,000. So overall, I hope that conveys the sense of extraordinary delivery in an ongoing challenging situation um, and a very clear understanding that we have more to do and plans to do so, some of which um, systems will be thinking through having received the planning guidance yesterday night.
Emily, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to open up for comments and questions. Can I, we might just gather some. Sure. Um, what I would um, ask you is a sort of a forward um, planning question. As we come through this last winter now, um, and you look at a number of the steps, I mean, Amanda alluded to some and you've alluded to others, which I think did make a, I mean, really good management steps, good cross-system working. And then if I list others, you know, that core bed provision of 5,000, yeah. the virtual wars, the record levels of vaccination, the working with the ambulances to get rotors working to get 8% more ambulances on the road, um, the 40 million into particular local authorities who had had struggled more than others in the previous year in, in terms of community bed provision, and therefore targeting that investment, a whole series of interventions. And I, I think it was, you know, we flu didn't hit us as badly as we thought, but actually we have come through this winter much, much better than we came through the previous winter. And then I really quickly add, but let's not be Pollyanna-ish, there's much, much more to do. But now look forward to next winter. Um, are we already planning for, have we started our planning for next winter? We did have started early last year. Are we doing it again this year? And if so, are there any partic particular areas that you would point to that, again, might make further material difference to how we perform I I in this next winter? I, uh, sorry, no, I, I said we'd gather some questions, didn't we? So, so Wal and then Mark. Here we go. Um, so Wal first and then, and then Mark. Thank you. Um, and then David. Uh, Dame Emily. Um, Mm -hmm. I did that just to keep you awake. Yeah. <laughs> um, recovery support programme obviously is an incredible amount of work your team does to help um, systems which are struggling to, to get better. Uh, but you've got finite resource. Um, so I'm interested in two things. One, how do you calibrate when an intervention is needed? And then also, I'm hoping there's movement in that grouping, or you're hoping to have movement in that grouping, so it's not the same people in that programme. How do, you, how do you get exits from that programme as well? Thank you. Good question. Uh, Mark and then David, I think, yeah. I mean, so firstly, just to say how fantastic it is that we have the data to... And this is so vital for managing the, the system as a whole. <clears throat> I couldn't help notice in the referral to treatment 65-week waits, it said including estimates for missing acute trusts. And I just wondered how many trusts were missing, and is, are they consistently missing? So uh, to what extent is the data, the data complete? So park that question for the moment. David? Um, Emily, thanks. Um, uh, just to um, uh, congratulate you and your teams and the staff delivering care for the continued month-on-month -month improvement. I, I think that's the thing that I take from the report. But I wonder, I, I'm fascinated by the number of people waiting for procedures and appointments. And I, I wonder if you could just say something about the flow of people. As I'm given to understand it, these are not the same people that have been waiting for this length of time. The, there's people moving through. And I just wondered whether, yeah. whether you could just actually help us better understand yeah. what the dimensions are around. Uh, around the waiting list. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Any other comments or questions? Emily, do you want to have a, do you have a go at those? Um, yes, quite varied. So um, <laughs> keep me honest on whether I've answered all of them. Um, so if I, if I start at the top, in terms of planning for next winter, then absolutely we have um, already started. Um, so the UEC team um, is working to fully evaluate, working with academic partners, the interventions, the high impact interventions from year one plan, um, some of that, we, we don't have the, the full results of that, but some of the early indications are embedded in some of what people have seen in planning guidance. Um, but we would expect to write out systems with an operational planning note um, when we have that data complete to indicate where are, the, where are the data showing that you have the biggest impact from those interventions. Um, we've also seen you know, different implementation approaches for some of the interventions that were outlined last year. And again, we now have not only evidence, but sort of blueprint help from systems that have put these in place, for example, single points of access that other systems can now learn from. And we're, we want to do more to help systems learn from each other, because what we can see nationally and what individual systems are experiencing will, of course, always be different. Um, so what we're hoping to do is to have that planning even earlier in the year to some extent than we did last year um, to, make, to make sure that, that systems have what they need to um, manage next winter. Um, we can't predict exactly what the pattern of flu will be, um, but I think we will say, you know, the, the pattern in the winter of 2023 was one 
large, very large flu spike um, at the same time as, as increased COVID cases. What we saw this time was a lower COVID, a lower, a lower flu spike, which started a bit later and we thought was coming down, but then actually wasn't. It plateaued really effectively through January and into February, and yeah. we're still seeing more um, flu patients in beds than we were last year, and there was also RSV around, which was, which is coming down now too. So it's not so much that one win... Well, very big spikes are obviously very hard to handle, but ongoing um, increased um, acute... Not just um, presentation, but acuity of respiratory disease has has a challenging impact on bed occupancy etc as we're seeing so um, we are planning for next winter we will keep on learning as we go from what systems experience is actually working for their population and we're hoping to be as helpful as possible with the evaluation of the various um, interventions that we've already looked at we've talked we've talked before you and I outside this um, session but anything to show I mean community beds um, how much does that represent potentially an opportunity do we know do we understand that data and utilisation um, better. There is more to do on right. the data because of the classification of what a community bed is, but what right. we do have is a full audit of all beds, which we did as part of the core bed delivery in January and February, and the UEC team are reviewing that with our communities team. Um, and of course, the interesting challenge with community beds is they're not all NHS beds. Yeah. Um, so it depends on how local systems are managing that um, intersection between NHS community beds and, um, and private sector. Um, but we know that, although the data is less good and less complete to the, to the uh, point that Mark was making, um, that there are uh, approximately 20,000 community beds and the length of stay in those is hugely variable, um, much more so than the variation within the acute trusts. And so we think there must be an opportunity to be looking at how systems are managing those. But because the data flows are quite different, that's something we think we need to work with systems to deliver yeah. rather than it being a single national initiative. But that will form part of our planning, uh, system planning for capacity next winter. Thank you. If I turn to RSP, um, which I haven't mentioned in this paper, but is obviously an important part of intervention in, in the most challenged systems. Um, when a system as is at NOF for it is allocated an improvement director and that improvement director is responsible for making a plan with the trust or the system about what are all of the levers that need to be pulled in order for that trust to exit um, from NOF 4 and, and drop to NOF 3 or improve to NOF 3. Um, and as the system's been going for, um, I think, two and a half years formally, we now know we, we have better data effectively on, on what have been the most effective interventions. Um, we do have a successful, systems have a successful record of leaving NOF and um, improving their performance substantively. And we have systems that have been in um, NOF 4 for almost the entire time that it's existed. Um, so one of the things we're doing in concert with looking at the overall um, operating model is what are the actually effective improvement interventions, whether that's in finance, in leadership, in operational performance, in clinical quality management, um, and trying to get better codified at those. But one of what we have to sign off at the beginning of each RSP um, uh, discussion is exactly how long do we think this trust should be in NOF 4 and then measuring progress against that and the um, quality committee reviews that on a regular basis. In terms of finite resource, that is a bit of a challenge at the moment um, because of the financial position. Julian and I are having conversations about how do we make sure we are improving finance and operations in concert with each other? Um, and are we appropriately using all four levels of the NOF framework to make sure we're directing attention in the right place? And I think there is work to do to codify some of the improvement mechanisms to make sure we've got the right improvement resource in the right place and make sure improvement resource is really directed at improvement and not just propping things up. Is that fair? More to do, I think, is a it, good and more to do uh, uh, <laughs> my opening remark. Um, in terms of the 65-week data, um, it is not regularly inconsistent, um, and we can see national data. It's quality checked locally. So I'm happy to look into that particular um, query, which I hadn't clocked, and, and get back to you separately. We wouldn't expect that to be... When we have flash reporting, then, yes, there are some systems that haven't been able to report for whatever reason, but I'm not sure what the what the gap in that particular one is. Um, it depends on the... It, it, it's being quality checked at a local level because raw data is often not 
um, usable nationally. So it's like it depends on the systems that trusts are using. Um, so mixed, but more to do. Mixed, but more. <laughs> that's going to be my mantra every time now. Yeah, but actually, I quite like. I don't know if Finn wants to come in, but I'm quite interested to know what the particular challenge with that data yeah. was, and I'll make sure I do understand it. Um, and in terms of flow, um, David, thank you for that question. I mean, on average, there's a there are seventy thousand. There's a movement of about seventy thousand daily. Um, I think, given the volumes which Amanda also referred to in terms of primary care, and that that varies obviously depending on the day of the week, etc. So if we if we just look at the, the 78 weeks, which, if I'm not careful, I'll use the current number four, which is not published. But the, as we say in the paper, the 78-week weights um, is a, was at 14,000 in the January published data. Um, so if we then look at people who entered the waiting list 78 weeks before that, which would have been the autumn of 22, all of, all of those people other than 14,000 will have had their procedure. So the fact that it stays public in published data around the 7.5 million or the 7.13 million in the acute data indicates huge movements every month. Um, and that's why it's actually helpful to look at the long waiters because that's where you can see the numbers moving in a different way than we can on the total wait list. I think it has been noted that um, in the commentary on the planning guidance that we are asking systems now to make sure they are focused on the management of the entire waiting list and not just, in inverted commas, narrowly focused on the long waits because we think that is where some of the productivity benefits will be. We, we must treat people who've been waiting this long for treatment and we must make sure that we're looking at the entire waiting list and, and allowing clinicians to make decisions about what's the right sequence and um, urgency of treatment at all levels of the waiting list. In the spirit of the progress that you outlined earlier and that month-on-month -month improvement, yes, that number about people waiting has always been um, roughly the same, but actually there is a phenomenal amount of change taking place within yes. there as people are going through. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Richard, if I may, I think yeah, the please. thing that uh, imp impresses me about uh, the report that has come through is about 18 months ago, I think we were asked to agree an urgent and emergency care strategy that laid out a number of these things. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're now seeing is that uh, strategy working its way through. Yeah. And um, I just think there's a powerful lesson in uh, setting out a strategic approach and then seeing it applied in a very kind of disciplined way. And... You know, we often talk about management grip, but I think there's a really good story about a strategy laid out and then the grip and then the revisions in the light of experience to that, which is playing its way through. And yes, there is a lot more to do and we shouldn't um, lose sight of that, but it, credit where credit's due, there's a, a, a significant um, record of marginal gains being expressed yeah. each month, which is working its way through. So... I just think it's worth pulling that out. May I just make a additional point, Richard? Um, of course. So thank you very much for saying that, and obviously the, um, massive credit to um, Sarah Jane and to Julian Redhead, the clinical lead on that area, and, and yeah. lots of other people. Yeah. The thing I hope people would also recognise is I think this is also is two additional things on top of what you said. The first is there's a strategy which has been t further developed by actual usage on the ground and then amended in order to say, fine, you know, that particular thing has delivered this benefit. This has delivered much more than we expect it to. And this one, actually, it's it's fine. It's a marginal benefit, but it isn't the one that's made the biggest difference. And so that regular ability to review the data, learn and then reinforce that locally, I think has been tremendous. And I, I think it's also a good example of trying, and we don't always get it 100% of making the interventions at the right level um, so that there is a level of ownership at trust level or at system level and some of the interventions obviously not just within the acute system, some at, U, some at ICB level, some at national level, and trying to get the right balance of capability and capacity in the right place has been really critical to delivery and, and there's more to, more to do. Thank you. Um, I mean, that was, uh, Emily, very good. Um, thank you very much. It gives us a good sense thank actually you. just for the operational scale. And the, and the level of provision um, that the NHS is 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 providing. Um, that was also uh, it's worth saying um, very much current operational performance. A reflection on that. 
And, you know, we had a very good conversation this morning on some of the longer-term enabling priorities. Yeah. So the private board, you know, we had an update again on the new hospitals programme. We had an update on long-term workforce plan. Julian gave us a sense for a long-term capital plan, which is, you know, um, emerging strongly. Um, and also with, with Vin, we had a very good update on the transformation directorate, looking at whether it's the NHS app or FTP or live services or, 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 or data um, available for research, or actually just digitalization of the front line or digitalization of UEC. So actually, um, there's a huge amount here going on of a longer term, potentially transformational nature, in addition, actually, Emily, to what you just portrayed for us in terms of just the, the sheer hard work of uh, NHS staff actually providing this level of this level of service. So thank you for that. Um, Julian, financial performance update. And do you want to do that and then also pick up again from your perspective on planning guidance sure. and budget? Um, so 23-24, uh, clearly we are in the final few days. Um, the, I've said for a while that we are forecasting a system overspend compared to plan of around a billion, just over a billion pounds. Clearly, we've had challenges throughout the, the year, uh, in particular, the impact of industrial action but also the ongoing impact of higher inflation than that forecast and from which we were originally funded. Um, the government has provided extra funding to cover the impacts of the strikes, around £1.2 billion, um, and we have reflected that people could do less because we've lost time and we reduced the active activity uh, target as a result. But the impact of inflation the kind of recurrent impact of higher inflation through 22-23 running into this year and then in 23-24, where the government's, uh, or the latest data, the owner's data, is that um, you know, inflation 22-23 is about 6.7%. At the time, the forecast had been about 4, 4.4, and is about the same again this year against a forecast of somewhere around 3 you know, the combined financial impact of that is about £1.7 billion, pounds, as you know, through 23-24. So the kind of the financial pressure has to be seen in that context. Nevertheless, uh, for the whole of the NHS mandate, we are forecasting to come in, uh, I mean, broadly, I'm still balance of probability confident we will come in under the budget. Uh, the official forecast in the paper shows a potential risk of up to £90 million pounds over on a £170 billion pound budget. So, um, I mean, it is very tight. It is very tight. We've managed the pressure this year. Clearly, in some areas, we have done less than uh, we would have hoped because of the financial pressure in systems. Uh, the NHS England Change Programme has basically... You know, who say, will have saved us this year over three hundred million pounds, which has uh, gone to balance the whole uh, budget. But it is it is clearly very tight, and whether we come in this year largely hinge, hinges on a couple of contractual disputes uh, out in the NHS. But um, look, I still think we will come in uh, on budget, but just on budget and on capital, where the total provider capital budget set by the department is £7.4 billion, pounds, and we are currently forecasting an underspend against that of £32 million. Pounds. So again, you know, there and thereabouts, like on the money. Um, so that sort of sets up the context for 24-25. As Amanda said, we formally published the guidance uh, yesterday evening, yesterday. Um, at the budget, the government provided, and we welcome, I mean really welcome, the extra funding the government provided, £2.45 billion, pounds, largely which covers the recurrent cost of the pay deals uh, agreed um, and already implemented over 23-24. 
um, it also means that certain things we might have had to do, we don't have to do. It means we can keep going with, for example, the investment in improvement resources to support uh, GP practices. It means we can keep going with the investment in maternity services, where we are putting in £180 million pounds next year. In fact, slightly more than £180 uh, million. Pounds. Uh, it means that uh, we you know, are still absolutely requiring systems to deliver on the mental health investment standard uh, next year. It means we can keep going with the extra investment into the pharmacy services as we seek to relieve some of the pressure on GP practices uh, over the course of next year and provide better access, better service to the, the public. But in the round, total NHS funding is next year forecast to be flat in real terms. Slightly better than flat, but like 0.25% uh, percent better than, um, than sort of flat real, better than just uh, staying in line with inflation. Clearly, some things are rising faster than inflation, which means we are, you know, there, there, there is a squeeze. Yeah. Uh, so as we look ahead at next year, the planning guidance sets out that despite that, we are still seeking to improve performance. Uh, it will not be a step change, uh, but we will still seek to keep on building on the progress we've made this year on four-hour performance, ambulance performance. Uh, we will continue to drive the virtual elimination of 65-week waits. And as Emily said, you know, can we continue to hold and improve the position on the total waiting list? Yeah. Um, we will keep going on expanding mental health services, uh, improving access uh, in primary care. But this is not a step change. This is very much a consolidation. We have put significant investment in over the course of the last two years into diagnostics, elective capacity, core beds. This is not a year where we're seeing, you know, we will see a further big increase in capacity. This is about consolidation and now really driving, you know, the best value out of those services. Um, now, we have seen um, an increase in substantive staffing this year. We are beginning to see, therefore, a reduction in temporary staffing costs. We're forecasting to spend £400 million less in 23-24 on agency staff compared to the previous year. Um, and we will need to see you know, and we are seeing, I think, a sort of an underlying improvement in productivity this year. If you look at the aggregate numbers, it doesn't look that different, but you just have to take account of the kind of level of strike action uh, that we have had. And if we hadn't had that strike action, we would have seen, uh, you know, a material improvement in productivity, I think, this year. So next year is consolidate, keep driving out uh, the costs of temporary staffing, where we are looking for at least the same again in, in terms of savings, so at least another 400 million, but really I think we will need to go further than that uh, in 24-25. We need every provider to really review where, where extra resource has gone in and make sure it's appropriate uh, and we are getting the best value uh, for, for it, whilst we, as I said, seek to just continue to improve uh, aggregate performance. And then clearly, uh, we are still looking to hold on to the investments and plans we are making into the long-term workforce plan, the continued investment in nursing, medical, and other clinical training places over the course of this next year, as well as uh, the investment to keep going with uh, the frontline digitization program, the rollout of the federated data platform, the development of the NHS app. And we are looking ahead to uh, the invest you know how we deploy and get the best value for the investment announced by the chancellor at the budget uh, the 3.4 billion pounds into technology enabled change which is you know a core component of how we deliver improved productivity in a sustainable nhs over the next parliament uh, and you know we will set out more details of that later in the summer so richard i will finish there so, comments or questions, um, reactions for for Julian? Well, 
Thanks. Um, thanks, Jim. As ever, it's, it's, it's hugely complicated and a lot of hard work to get to the, the numbers. Um, and of course, the system going forward is pressured. The, um, the, the 3.4 billion, which uh, was announced in the budget, is, as I think Amanda said, transformational. I think I really believe that. It's very, very good news. Could, could, is it, I mean, maybe you, Jill, and perhaps Vin, just comment on how we see that um, money being sort of dispersed over time. Uh, and into what activities, because not all of it is going to be on the sort of shiny stuff that people will see. It's really important that we recognise there's quite a lot of backbone stuff to do as well. So should we get Vin to start, June, if you want to come in and in, in support the Vin? Do you want to take that off? Yeah, thanks, Will. So in the budget, I think the Chancellor announced three chunks that the 3.6 billion is divided into. Firstly, more than half of it is directed towards uh, improving the basic underlying infrastructure of the NHS. So that ranges from everything from you know improving the underlying broadband infrastructure and bandwidth and so on to providing new uh, what we call end user devices but actually devices that staff can use for example computers on wards or in outpatient clinics or in gp surgeries handheld devices so you can enter data actually while you're standing next to the patient um, there's about another 450 million that's provided for further development of the app the chair's already talked about the transformational impact of the app and some of the plans that we have both to uh, build further on its existing features to help patients navigate their way around the health system, organise appointments, rearrange them, uh, order prescriptions uh, and uh, access NHS 111 uh, and also to introduce a new digital health check into it. And then uh, the remaining amount is for upgrading our data infrastructure. The Federated Data Platform is one example of that. But we also want to improve faster data flows that will improve the way that information uh, is uh, travels around the NHS, for example, both to support direct clinical care, but also to support the reporting uh, of data, for example, for the purposes of this board, in order that we can organise care uh, most effectively. Uh, there is money also in the budget, finally, for innovation. Uh, there's two specific examples that are called out of AI tools that can support productivity, making it easier for clinicians to do tasks uh, to enable them and release more time for care. But there will be other innovations within that package of things that are not set out. Um, the job of the next year that we've got is actually to um, put details onto that plan and we will be very clearly setting out the key milestones uh, that we will follow over the course of that how we will gain productivity benefits out of it, and most importantly, how staff will actually see benefits in real life that will make their working lives easier. Well, I mean, I would um, just add to your to your phraseology. I mean, I agree it is um, transformational, actually, because actually one of the other reflections, uh, uh, and perhaps I, I can do it, although I know a number of the uh, board colleagues share it. I mean, as an old finance director from the private <laughs> sector, I am... Um, always delighted um, at the ability you have, Julian, with your team and through the systems engagement at managing what is a clearly very, very sizable budget and you manage it um, really well to come in as close to and but really close to budget. I mean, my ability to do that in my old world, I have to admit, um, I had nothing like your um, nothing like your skill set. But one of the ways it happens, of course, actually is some pretty... Um, stark decisioning you have to make with the executives. So, for instance, when late last year we're having to look at how we fund the cost of the industrial action, in the end there's contributions from Treasury, there's contributions from the Department of Health, um, and then we make our contributions, one of which actually used to, was last year actually slowing down significantly or stopping a number of technology investments, which are a, it's a very necessary shorter term measure, but actually for the longer term, if we're going to transform, we've got to stay steady. And the, why I think it is transformation isn't just the sum. It isn't just the fact, actually, that um, the sum derived actually from very good presentations, Amanda, by you and Julian, essentially into the Treasury around where would we spend it, what would we ask for, and so on, which now needs to be delivered in more detail with milestones, but actually we painted the picture um, very, very, very clearly. But actually, it's effectively ring fence. It's a commitment yes. around a technology spend, which we can carry on with, and that will have transformational benefit. Whereas, in fact, in this last year, one of the things you had to do was actually pull back quite suddenly late on in the year to to help us meet the the budget. And one of the areas you had to go to was actually effectively um, technology spend. 
Um, whether we'd have spent it all anyway is different, but actually we certainly stopped the progression of, uh, of the spend or delayed in a number of projects, that, uh, those spend levels. So I think it's both the amount, it's the fact we painted a picture for government of where we would like to deploy it, and also it's the fact that it's now ring fenced. So it goes alongside other, I think, longer term changes made and commitments made in our prioritisation, like the long-term, essentially the long-term workforce plan. And here with the technology committed ring-fenced amount, we can put that alongside it and really start to think about how the NHS will transform and change um, going forward over the medium term. It's really good. Can I have just one, one plea? That's the disbursement side. No, this is for Julian. Um, it's that, and I know it's not entirely without control, but I'm slightly speaking to other, other, other interested parties. If we can make the approval process actually meet the ambition of what we're trying to do, which is slicker, more agile, you know, really focused on, on getting to the right answer quickly, that would be helpful. And I don't know whether you have any comments on that, but it's quite complicated as we have it currently. Yeah, uh, look, I'll just pick up on a couple of things. Uh, first of all, as Vin has said, you know, a lot of the investment we will we will put in just needs to go into making the basics really work well and create a foundation upon which you can then build the stuff which enables uh, some of the kind of more exciting service transformation. But it's actually how do we just make it work? Boring plumbing. Or, the, yeah. you know, for, for actually our doctors, our nurses, uh, all of the staff uh, in the NHS. Um, the second thing just to say is, you know, as we... As we we're having to do things to balance all the pressures last year. Clearly, those are decisions we are having to make with government agreed Indeed. with government about how we deal with yeah. uh, those pressures and what is sort of funded by the Treasury, what compromises are having to be made within the department, as well as you know what compromises are having to be made uh, within the NHS. Those aren't just our call. Um, and on the uh, sort of decision-making process, I mean... It's always hard because inevitably um, the government, the Treasury, are putting a lot of money into things and uh, they want to know those things are well spent, are well well spent, spent yeah. and um, you know, they've got as much as reassurance as you can do that it's the things they always planned for and they're going to get the outcome that they want on behalf of uh, taxpayers. So, I mean, in one sense, government's big. Inevitably, there are going to be quite a lot of people involved uh, we are working as hard as we can, be it in the new hospital programme or the technology programmes or whatever it might be, just to create smooth processes, really effective relationships with our colleagues in the department, the Treasury and the Cabinet Office. I'm going to bring um, Ruth in a moment. I, I, Emily, just um, for you, something I think you were sharing with us this morning, it goes to, to Julian's theme about uh, sort of a consolidation year. But actually, the significant investment that we've received and had has been deployed into um, diagnostic centres, community diagnostic centres. So that, as far as we can see it, that trajectory, but we've built, we built out, haven't we, I think, much more significant. We've built out more diagnostic capacity, whether we've still got enough, but actually we've built out significant diagnostic capacity, which has lifted quite substantially, I think, the number of diagnostic, diagnostic interventions carried out over the last 18 months or so. Is that right? Yes, that's the 113% increase um, year on year that, that I mentioned in the 2.34 million diagnostic events in January 24. Um, and there, um, there are currently 156 CDCs operating and should be 159 by um, next week. So the, and those have been carefully located working with um, ICBs to try and address some of the disparities in accessibility of the hospital sites. Um, we don't yet have data to show exactly how that's um, played through, but we will do that evaluation over the next few months. Very good. Thank you. Ruth, you want to come in, I think? Yeah, thank you. So uh, I welcome the plan. And even, uh, you know, Amanda has put uh, her name to the forward. Julian is presenting it. Actually, this is a document that speaks to every member of a board. Uh, so I know that chief nurses, medical directors will be reading this in detail. So I very much welcome the first point in the priorities, the first bullet point, where it talks about the importance of quality uh, and, of course, particularly maternity and neonatal services and seeing that throughout the plan, ensuring we continue the delivery of the delivery plan is really important. 
And then, of course, it's got lots of great things in about a women's hub in every ICB, a focus on children and people, lots on equality, diversity and inclusion. Martha's Rule is in there, which I'm really pleased to see, plus more. And then, Julian, you in that one t long table, you know, I do genuinely back the plan to reduce the agency spend, uh, particularly in my profession, but all, also in medical. I know Steve would back that too, as well as other professionals. Getting that down, particularly now we've got more substantive staff, uh, does need to continue to be a real focus this year. Thank you. Thank you. Vin, do you want to come in? Thanks, so, uh, just going back to technology, I think it's probably just worth saying three things. Uh, so, the first thing is, I think, even over the last year, we have hit all of our commitments on technology. So, for example, uh, we hit the target for 90% of trusts to have an electronic patient record ahead of schedule in uh, in December of this year. Still got 10% to go, which is a significant number, but getting ahead of schedule, what we agreed with government, is really significant. We're ahead of our target for uh, the number of patients uh, who are downloading the NHS app. Uh, so you've got the NHS app in your pocket and Pharmacy First required a significant amount of work to connect community pharmacies to the GP record so that the consultations that pharmacists are carrying out can be connected in. And so I think that is very important that the technology teams have done a lot in the last year. We've not been standing still. If you look forward to the next year, because the money that the Chancellor's announced doesn't flow till 25, 26, but over the next year there's some really significant commitments to technology investment in the uh, operational planning guidance, and we'll crack on and be delivering those in the next year. But in the preparation for the 25, 26, we will also uh, be doing, as uh, Deputy Chair has indicated, and as Julian talked about, working closely with colleagues in government uh, to make sure that we are absolutely ready to hit the ground running and turbocharge our investment in technology from 25-26. Emily? Just a really quick point, because of what Vince just said reminded me about the answer to Mark's question. Um, as trusts have been implementing EPR systems, they've paused yeah. reporting on RTT um, in order to move to the new system, so that will be what the what that chart was referring to. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Very fast footwork, Emily, if I might say it. But, um, um, June, any, any, June, is there anything else you'd want to add, either around budget or, or planning guidance? We've got financial performance for the year. Uh, I don't think so. No, Very okay. good. Um, should we move on? Okay, let's go to um, next item. It's item six, I think, on the agenda. So um, ADHD... And Claire, Claire, you and Catherine, I think, are going to um, walk us through this or draw out the main points. I mean, it's a very good paper. Um, I mean, obviously, assume it's been read, um, but but if you can draw out the main points, that'd be very helpful. And I think Steve's going to just. Oh, is it Steve? Yeah. That was a hospital pass. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> no. I've just been corrected by Amanda. Actually. So, Steve, if you'd like to start, and then we'll bring Claire and Catherine. Don't yeah. worry. Um, look, look, Richard and Chair, thank you very, very much uh, for the time on the agenda today. Um, hopefully the paper is pretty self-explanatory, but just to try and give a bit of a frame as to the why, um, why this is here, why now, and a bit about the work that's um, been done. Um, I think a, num a number of colleagues have been involved in this work, and I think we're really clear that this is a really important issue for us to lean into. Uh, ADHD can have a really quite profound impact on many aspects of people's lives and their life chances, whether that's in uh, academic, uh, the academic arena, whether it's in work or broader um, social functioning. Um, people living with ADHD and their families deserve a caring and effective set of support from the NHS, but also more broadly across wider society and wider sectors. Um, and I think hopefully what colleagues will see um, from the work that's been done so far and uh, in the paper that for the NHS's part in this, we're really determined um, to play that really well. There isn't a cure for ADHD, but it is possible um, to help manage the problems um, that people living with ADHD face. Um, there is obviously a, a medication, um, which has been the area of particular intensive focus more recently with some of the supply challenges but there's also much more uh, more broad support advice and non-therapeutic interventions that are available 
As I think colleagues are aware, uh, NHS providers have been reporting an increase in demand for a variety of reasons, um, including increased awareness. And I think you can see that increased awareness um, in, uh, from a variety of settings, but you can also see what people are looking at in terms of information uh, that they're seeking. And in 2023, ADHD was the second most viewed condition on the NHS website. There were 4.3 million page views, which I think tells us something about, uh, about the, the awareness and the importance of this issue in society. Um, that's possibly also been exacerbated by some of the medication supply challenges um, that have been uh, experienced, of course. Um, but we have been learning from uh, the work that regions have been doing about the pressure uh, that providers have been reporting, and I think it's fair to say that that exists across the country. And it's really important uh, that, as far as possible, the NHS is able to put in place the infrastructure and the range of support that people need. Um, as a consequence of that, back in December, Amanda asked us to bring together people to consider the issues relating to ADHD, not to solve the problem immediately, but to try and understand what was happening and to lay a path uh, for what particular improvements and interventions might look like in the future. Uh, that's include a focus on understanding the data that we have. Uh, it's had a focus uh, on the use and the role of therapeutics or so medication. Uh, we've tried to understand uh, what's driving some of the growth and the variation that we see in access and outcomes across different populations. And also how well uh, services are joined up across health, education and justice in particular. Um, Claire is, Claire's going to pick this up in a second, but Claire has chaired a clinical reference group uh, which has had very strong engagement and has explored five areas that are set out um, in the paper. And um, we're, the paper sets out some of the key findings and some of the next steps. I think it's important to say that in addition to some of the challenges that are clearly highlighted um, in the paper and through the work that's been done, uh, there are many services and many places that are doing really good work. And I want to just, there, there are, of course, it's, there's now too many to mention, uh, but I want to just particularly call out Derbyshire and Hertfordshire. Um, and again, those, those areas have been heavily involved and influenced some of this work. And there's a kind of particular thank you um, to Ed Knowles and Elliot Howard-Jones, two colleagues in the West Hertfordshire and West Essex um, system who have been doing some really innovative thinking and work across their system um, in support of improving access for people living with ADHD. Uh, we spent a bit of time with them earlier this week, uh, on, and their model includes a single front door, triage, uh, and then simple pathways for onward referral. It includes support while people are waiting, and that is done in partnership with the voluntary sector and families with lived experience. And, and so we think there's some really interesting things that's, that are already happening in the NHS that can be explored further um, in the second phase of work. As I said, this is a, this is a step um, in many respects. The findings are an important step. They're not the full answer. Um, and what we need to do now is test and develop um, some of that thinking and the potential solutions uh, with stakeholders and importantly with people living with ADHD and their families. And it's really important that we do this cross-sector, which is exactly what um, uh, the Hertfordshire and West Essex system have done. Their, their work has not been done just within the NHS. It's been done in partnership with the voluntary and community sector, with the education sector and with local government. And so, as you'll see in the paper, um, what we are proposing to do is build on the work that we've done so far and to take forward the findings um, to set up a cross-sector task force that will bring together the NHS, uh, our Widem sister partners, including local government, schools, um, clinicians from the NHS, the voluntary sector, and beyond, so that we end up with a really joined up um, piece of work. That is particularly important, as it says in the paper, for ADHD, as, as the solutions don't lie within the gift um, of the NHS alone. So we hope that that will lead um, in the not 
too distant future to a bit of a turning point uh, for people living with HDHD who are currently trying to navigate uh, quite a complex um, system in, in seeking support. So, Chair, that's all I was going to say. I hope that makes sense. I'm going to hand to Claire, who's going to talk about the work of the CRG and Catherine on next steps. And as you do that, just to say, I'm, I'm sure the board's seen it, that what we're asked to do is to, is to note essentially the work um, undertaken today, but it's actually to endorse actually what you were just talked about, which is the next steps around a task force, as yeah. a multidisciplinary task force effectively. But, okay, Claire? Thank you, Chair. So um, I'm Claire Fuller, I'm a GP, and I'm the Primary Care Medical Director for NHS England. So I just want to start by saying thank you to Amanda and to Steve because it's been uh, an absolute privilege w uh, working on this project. So uh, Steve and Amanda asked uh, Claire Murdoch and myself to, to take the lead operationally and clinically, and then we've had the absolute joy of working with Catherine here. Uh, and actually the energy that it has unlocked, enabling us to take the time to actually look at the issues and understand what is going on, has been the thing I think that will make this a really important piece of work for us to do. So I... I set up the clinical reference group, 40 clinicians came together, they were multi-professional, multi-specialism, and we met for a total of 20 hours, um, twice as a big group and then in much smaller groups, having several hour-long conversations in real depth about the topics as Steve um, outlined, so looking at diagnosis, looking at neurodiversity in the round, so although many autistic people also have ADHD the, yeah, there are there are also many people that have ADHD uh, as a single um, as a single entity that we need to make sure that we look after people in the way that works best. We looked a lot at the prescribing interventions. We also looked at those uh, interventions that are supported that do not involve medication. That I don't <coughs> think we necessarily have paid enough attention to. Um, previously and one of the things that two of the things that were particularly interesting was actually the role of health inequalities and the fact that the population within our prisons are more likely to have ADHD than those people not in prison which I, uh, I think is quite shocking as well and also the impact of adverse childhood events and trauma mm. upon the number of people that actually present with ADHD. We also talked uh, quite a lot about secondary gain so ADHD is an unusual uh, a diagnosis. So as, as a GP, it is a diagnosis that people often come and will knock on the door and will seek the diagnosis. That doesn't happen with many conditions. And it's spending a little bit of time actually understanding why, uh, why that's happening and why that's happening more at the moment. So uh, from the groups that met, three themes came out in almost every conversation, regardless of what title we put at the top of the conversation, which I think is always quite telling that you're having the right conversation. So we talked a lot about the right person, the right pathway and the right support. So this is, again, uh, the role of health inequalities and actually making sure that we uh, are getting the right support to the right people. We find that people are actually... Uh, on multiple pathways rather than actually receiving personalised care in a way that works for them. And also we found that people were, have, in terms of the right support, often the diagnosis was used as the end point rather than actually something that should enable people to receive the support that they need. We kept talking about converging spaces, and uh, Steve's very much talked to, talked to this already. It's, it's around the need that this isn't something that the NHS can or should try to solve on its own. Every conversation talked about the role of education, the role of the health and justice system, the, the role of um, work, and the role of families as well. And then we talked about the paradox of care. So this is one of those things that actually having more contact isn't necessarily making things better for people. So... I was in the surgery last Friday, and coincidentally, my very first patient that came in uh, was the uh, mother of a 14-year-old girl who's been excluded from school. Uh, she had been referred by her school into local services. She, the, her mother had made a self-referral, and she'd also been seen by the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, who had also made a referral, and her mother was coming in to me to ask for another referral which you can see the frustration that is building for both individuals and the impact on this uh, young person's life in terms of uh, not receiving the appropriate support. But instead of obviously doing a fourth referral for this young person, we instead phoned um, up the mental health uh, trust involved and worked through what we might be able to do in a different way. So I'm going to hand over to Catherine, who will talk through the next steps for us. Thank you, Claire. I also wanted to start by saying what an absolute privilege and pleasure it's been to lead on this work over the last few months. Um, working with system leaders, clinical experts like you, Claire, um, and teams from across NHS England, the energy and enthusiasm from everyone involved to make a difference to the lives of those living with 
or seeking treatment for ADHD has really been quite extraordinary and something I, I've not seen before. So Claire talked about the, the work of the clinical reference group. We also gathered system leaders and experts across NHS England, and we also spent many hours uh, sharing expertise and discussing and analysing it. And the overarching conclusion was clear, which is that ADHD service provision and interrelated policies need a joined up approach across healthcare, education and the justice system. And there was an overwhelming desire expressed for the issues faced uh, by those living with or seeking treatment for ADHD to be considered in a holistic, person-centred way. And the task force that we want to establish is going to be an important framework for doing that. And critical to its success is going to be a program of engagement with people and communities that will underpin it. So we can now move quickly to appoint chairs and members and agree a terms of reference and get that work moving. But alongside the work of the task force, NHS England is going to use the findings that the paper sets out and that Claire has just shared to do what we can to help systems and patients now. We've already started our national data improvement work because we know that it's critical to understand more about the people seeking and receiving treatment, how long they're waiting to access it, and what treatment it is that they are receiving, and then to be able to monitor the impact of changes that we intend to make. And given the evidence that we have about services not keeping pace with need, we need to better understand the NHS and independent sector provider and commissioning landscape. So we're going to undertake some detailed mapping of the provider landscape. We're going to engage with providers and analyse their outcomes. And we're going to do this in partnership with stakeholders and systems. But again, we've already started this work and Steve has set out some of the really fantastic uh, work that we've seen in Hertfordshire, in Derbyshire in particular. Um, we know that uh, the practice in Derbyshire in particular has been brilliant in terms of an all-age pathway that they have developed. Um, and we're going to share all of the good practice that we are uncovering nationally and across the system. And we've also started to work with Vin and his team to think about how tech can help to improve services as well. So there's a lot to do. It's really exciting and we're all committed to getting it right. But if I may, I'm going to leave you with some words that one of our ADHD programme team has given me. As a colleague at NHS England who has lived experience of neurodivergence, both autism and ADHD, it's immensely encouraging to see, hear and feel the passion and drive to improve the care, support and outcomes for people with ADHD. This phase of work has done much to recognise the challenges in the system, to accept that some of those challenges are artefacts of the way things have been done and also highlight the commitment to work collaboratively to make things better. Thank you. Uh, I am going to open up the comments, actually, because we've got... Uh, um, Simon, I'm, I'm going to go to you, Simon, first and see if you have any comments. It's probably your fairly obvious target to go for, I think, in terms of commentary first, but also Helen. I know Helen will come to Navina and, and others around the table. But Simon, would you like to comment? Yeah, it's a tricky one. I mean, ADHD isn't new. You might be forgiven that you think that it might be from the publicity mode, it isn't. It's been around for at least three or four decades, largely in children where it's well recognized. The prevalence is around 2% in the UK. And, uh, and I should, by the way, one the group you should mention is our group at King's who gave you a systematic review in hours. Well, our <laughs> four days, anyway, four days. And the number of uh, children diagnosed and known with ADHD has always been under 2%, suggesting that uh, we don't have a problem of overdiagnosis and there might be a problem of underdiagnosis. Now, I say that because in America, which has a similar prevalence, the number of children receiving stimulants and the treatment for ADHD is uh, one of the treatments, the drug treatment is stimulants is 15 percent, mm. suggesting that they have a major um, over uh, 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 um, diagnostic uh, issue. One reason in the UK uh, treatment is largely given for behavioral problems. In America, it's given uh, to improve academic performance, uh, which are really very different things. And so there's a big issue in America. In the UK, it's traditionally not been, been that. Um, it's usually thought that it gets better as you get older. 
And what has changed in recent years has been more and more emphasis on adult ADHD, which is a much harder to categorize condition. And that is the one that has shown a remarkable increase in um, media, in presentation, in demand, in a really very short space of time. It's unlikely that a, a change on that scale is simply due to better recognition or, or help seeking. And it suggests that there's a degree of um, diagnostic creep uh, going on or re-evaluation re, uh, of uh, feelings, symptoms, emotions, etc. So it's a complicated issue. It's happening very fast, as I'm sure you know. Now the problem has been um, in CAM services. We don't. We've still, despite the investment, don't have sufficient people in CAMs. And the main problem that has for the last few years been waiting lists. And that's important because to get a diagnosis of ADHD, it is absolutely essential you have a multidisciplinary assessment. And because there are many other issues that could be going on, child psychiatry and, and psychology is complicated. And with a good multidisciplinary assessment, you can get a good, reliable diagnosis and lead on to management and treatment. That's is failing at the moment. A lot of people are waiting too long and are being diverted into private practice, which is not, and, and private providers, some of whom, as you saw that panorama program, are less than, well, how should we put it, not, do not have the standards that we would expect and uh, seem to make the diagnosis incredibly easy and certainly don't work in multidisciplinary teams and then push back into primary care of people now who have a label which may or may not be correct. And that's where some of the problems we're seeing at the moment are coming from. But I would say that when you see this remarkable change in a very short period of time, you need to think also not just about increased um, awareness, help seeking, but also about cultural and social factors. So it's good that you're taking this very seriously and properly. Um, I think there are t the issues in adults are not the same as the issues in children and actually rather more difficult. And just remember that the medication prescribed is a class two drug and it is not without its side effects. In fact, they can be quite severe. It's, uh, um, and we need to think about that as well, which is why we need to proceed with caution. Simon, thank you. Um, Helen, would you like to comment? Just briefly. Um I was absolutely delighted to see this on the agenda because, you know, like you, Claire, frontline GP, and this is something that we've seen a huge upswing in people seeking uh, help with, particularly adults. So children and young people has been a constant drumbeat throughout my professional for the many decades in practice. Um, but actually, it's the adults coming forward. And for many people, my, per my perception, and I'm really curious to see what comes out of your work, is that what many people want is to understand themselves better so that they can carry on living their lives. They've, been, they've known that in some way they are slightly different from their peers, or their work colleagues, and a lot of people come to me when they're having HR difficulties or they're having trouble at work or trouble with relationships and trying to make sense of it. And I think the media upswing, I think as you alluded to, Richard, has brought a huge amount of awareness and people questioning the of self. Whereas, of course, in younger people, we've had, you mentioned, Simon, about school performance and so on, and in a more disruptive sense, people needing something more urgent. And so if we can disentangle it, we can help people and work out what the NHS should and could be doing and work out what other agencies could and should be doing. And if we can then inform wider society and cross-government <coughs> approaches, I think that would be a huge gift from the NHS to the wider system. So thank you. Um, I'm personally delighted and full support from me, but uh, thanks for doing the work you've done so far. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. Thank you very much. And Simon, any, any other comments or reflections? Amanda, do you want to? Uh, David, sorry. So thank you. Uh, and uh, Simon, thanks for the masterclass in a <laughs> soundbite as well. Um, I think to the point that for children, this has been uh, around for a long time. In fact, I think pretty much all of my career and as a director of social services, this was one of the key issues that people were presenting because they, in order to get access to special education, you need an assessment and a statement yeah. to get that. And actually, Claire, your story about uh, the mum that came into your surgery last Friday, for me, is very typical. Mm -hmm. These are kids who were often suspended from school, not in school, from the poorer families, etc. So uh, actually, the emphasis around interagency working and getting the buy-in of both education and local government is going to be absolutely essential. And this issue about being clear about the respective roles that the different agencies and professionals play, 
I do think is, is critical. And um, this week on the radio, we've had the local government association saying the fastest rising overspending budget in local government is the home to school transport budget. Mm. With these kids, they're the same kids. And just, just to make one last point, I mean, it is sometimes easy to be skeptical about some of these diagnoses. But myself and Lana Singh wrote a paper in The Lancet four or five years ago, looking at, and, and people worry about giving medication to children. There seems to be something that that's, a lot of people think that that's kind of wrong. You just shouldn't do it. And actually, what we showed was that children who had a good, proper diagnosis of ADHD, when done in a multidisciplinary way, and then who were treated with stimulant medication, they inst rather people say, oh, you know, you're drugging children. In fact, they felt much more authentic on medication. And when asked, which do you think is your true self? They said, I'm much better when I'm on medication. That's what I feel is the real me. When I'm off medication, I'm a very different person and you know, everything is chaotic, etc. So it's easy to be skeptical about that. And I like being skeptical. But actually, <laughs> when properly diagnosed with proper treatment, proper teams, etc., it's a very important and useful diagnosis. Yeah. Thank you. Amanda. Can I, yeah, do you mind if I just uh, just uh, say one final thing at the end? So I think it's been a brilliant conversation, but actually I just wanted to add, if I may, my thanks to Steve, to Claire Murdoch, who's not able to be here, as well as Claire Fuller, who is, and Catherine. Um, because when I asked you to pick up this work, it was because we really recognised that this was a complicated issue, but it was also something that was difficult and really mattered and we were hearing not just from colleagues within the NHS but actually from really important partners like Health Watch that this was something that was high on their agenda and I just uh, want to thank you for the very thoughtful way that you've approached it and um, you know not trying to oversimplify a complex issue as this discussion has actually just absolutely brought out uh, but also in coming up with really concrete next steps uh, but that also aren't closing down into a set of immediate actions they're doing some immediate actions but there are some immediate actions that are about coming up with a longer term model of care that picks up on many of the points that Simon, Helen and David have just made about the importance of seeing this not just as a health issue but as a health issue in, you know, in that much broader context um, so just thank you for that uh, I suppose thank you to Health Watch actually for their, uh, their encouragement of us to look at something which um, is the first time and we've properly stood back uh, uh, and had a had a look at this in the way that you have done. Uh, but I also just wanted, um, if I may, Richard, just to thank the youth ambassadors who I know have been part of. You've mentioned the, C, uh, the, the clinical reference group and the 20 hours you've spent with them and all of the input you've had from so many people already. But the youth ambassadors who are part of the Children and Young People's programme work, I know have lent, and you just gave a brilliant example, Catherine, their voices and their lived experience to this in a way that I think has also demonstrably enriched the understanding and the approach. Very good. So can, um, so with the board should note the report and uh, give approval for the next steps, Please. Task Force. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, um, let's go on to the next um, agenda item. I mean, Julian, I think it, we can probably cover it relatively briefly. I think the paper is pretty clear. It's a start item for for approval of the board and it's specialised commissioning. It's an update as we can see on um, uh, a number of the specialised services for delegation. Julian, is there anything you'd like to comment so, on the paper? Um, so I think the things to, to note or yeah, yeah. To, to note. Uh, so we've discussed this a few times over the last yeah. couple of years. Yeah. Uh, last December we, the board agreed that we would move to the full delegation of specialised services. Uh, just to be clear, the NHS England retain responsibility for the service specification for the relevant services, uh, but the funding and the responsibility for commissioning those services passes to integrated care boards. That's right. So the two things to note are, number one, we have done uh, some further work to complete our view and recommendation on those services which we are going to delegate yep. and those services we are going to retain. retain. And broadly, there are 70 services. I mean, they're the vast bulk of, of the kind of volume that we are uh, delegating. There are 104 that we will uh, retain. And um, Annex A sets out the final set of those we have decided, you know, where we were still undecided that we are going to uh, delegate 
versus those we're going to re retain. Uh, the second thing is uh, to note that as of the 1st of April, i.e. next week, uh, responsibility for commissioning de the delegated services in the east of England, yeah. the Midlands and the Northwest will pass to the ICBs in those regions. They're largely operating it under uh, you know, sort of single joint commissioning arrangements, um, but it will pass to them with the with the clear plan uh, that all regions and I, all ICBs will take on responsibility for delegate uh, for commissioning uh, as of the first of April, twenty twenty five. So that yeah. means the rest of the ICBs in the southwest, the southeast, London, and the northeast will be a and, year later. Yeah, yeah, and I can confirm that in those where we are uh, delegating it this year. They have signed the agreements and we are sort of ready to go as of the 1st of April. So it's just an update to note consistent with yeah. uh, the decisions made in previous board meetings. Yeah, so we've identified those which we're delegating, we've identified those which we're retaining. We're giving full delegation without joint working to three of the ICBs, the intention with the other four, sorry, regions. Three of the regions. Regions, sorry. The ICBs in for the ICBs yeah. in their regions, and then the other four regions and their ICBs we anticipate by um, this time, effectively next yeah. year, for delegation. Mark, you want to make a comment? Yes, I asked about this last time it came up here. Um, I mean, I do have some concerns, which is that there's possibly a danger of sort of postcode access to some of these. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's also potentially a danger of uh, lots of um, uh, specialist services being set up where in some cases there's quite limited capacity to do it. Um, some of the conditions on this list are really extremely rare. So, for yeah. example, specialist immunology services for adults and children with deficient immune systems, encompassed in that are some incredibly rare conditions where there may only be a handful of cases uh, in the UK. Um, and so the issue to me is that given we remain the accountable commissioner for the entire portfolio, I think setting the specifications is one thing. I think the question is, is how are we going to exert our accountability in terms of ensuring that the people with these uh, rare conditions retain access to first-class services? I think it's a point well made. Steve, do you have a comment? Or? Uh, yeah, well, yes. I mean, clearly the conditions on this list are complex conditions and and obviously um, rarer than the um, conditions that um, ICBs commission, that's the nature of specialised commissioning. Uh, I think, I think, and the point is, as you've made, that NH England uh, retains the accountability and therefore will have a, a role in overseeing and monitoring, and if there are concerns, uh, removing that delegation. And I know, having spoken to the specialised commissioning team, that they... Uh, they are very aware that that um, accountability remains and um, this is a process that will require um, oversight. So I think you make a, Mark, I think you do make a, a, a very good point. This has been a, a I'm going to say a two year, probably longer than two, but in my time here, a two year walkthrough as we thought about the need to delegate through down to the ICBs, part of that structure via the regions. We do remain that retain that accountability. I think there's been a very thoughtful process. You know, we've done this exercise of joint working with our specialised commission unit, with the, um, with the relevant um, regions and ICBs, and made the judgment that these can therefore get delegated. And as you can see in the appendix, a number of the specialised commissioning services have been retained. I think you put the point you make is a good one, and it's just a sort of... Uh, was it mind our eye that we just need to keep a very close monitor on it? I mean, I wouldn't now reverse but sitting no, at the bottom. I know you're not suggesting that we yeah. do, given that it's been through quite a rigorous control process of assessment by those closest to it. But the point you make, the point you make about will specialise, will there be some sort of separate setup, or is there a postcode lottery, or will um, some of these services not get funded as they might have been funded if it had remained a central service? Um, we just have to watch for that. We have to watch for that. Julian? I mean, I will just, I mean, absolutely, uh, as Steve has said, in terms of the oversight of the quality, performance, yeah. uh, and access to services, services is held, you know, we still hold responsibility. And of course, I'll just remind us all that the reason for us to, one of the core reasons for us to do this is actually to improve access yeah, across locally. the, the uh, country where at the moment you'll often find access is better, where it's, you know, uh, sort of in the direct 
sort of geographical location of where some of those services are lo located. So it's absolutely how do we improve access right. across the country to these services. Uh, I think to Richard's point, um, as outlined in paragraph 12 to 15, there has been a very robust clinical evaluation process before the recommendation came to the executive board. Uh, and I have spoken to the specialised commissioning team about this. So uh, I am assured that they have gone through a thoughtful um, process, but there is a need for ongoing monitoring, absolutely. So I think um, hearing Mark, I'm hearing Mark's very good question, and just keeping that in mind, is the board comfortable with approval of um, this paper or these delegated yeah. services. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Let's go on to um, item eight. I think this is relatively um, straightforward. These are directions and mandatory requests for information, and there are two broad directions that we've received. Um, there's a summary of community services data set amendment directions issued to us as NHS England by the Secretary of State. And separately, there's a summary of um, some cancer programme pilots evaluation directions, again in 24, again issued to NHS England um, by, the, by the Secretary of State. That was in February. Um, we put these through our usual processes, so they've been approved for acceptance um, by our Director of um, Information Governance, and also actually, I think, um, uh, um, by VIN, so our National Director, of transformation and also our national Steve, our national medical director. So actually, we've looked at the directions. We've assured that we can do them, and we've accepted those. Um, we've accepted those directions as given to us by the the Secretary of State, and they've been published on the NHS England website. So um, it's for information only, just for the board to see those. Um, the next item is just a report. Julian, you've been busy. Um, it's a report. Um, it's, it's twice a year. Um, it's in accordance with Section 9 of Standing Orders, and it's a detail of documents that have been authorised and sealed with the NHS England seal between, I think, 11th of October of uh, last year and the 7th of March of, of, of this year. And it's, again, provided to the Board for information um, by the Secretariat. And then, if I can go, if the Board is comfortable to note that, that information. Sorry. What are they? So we, we had this last time, and I stuck my hand up and said, yes, I agree. But yeah. what are you putting a seal on? And they're largely contracts. Contracts, contracts or leases or agreements. For, for leases for building. For example, um, every time we give a grant to purchase a house so that someone who is like an inpatient learning disability setting oh, right. can move got out. And it's mainly property house, capitalism. Or, oh, that's good. Uh, where... <laughs> We are giving capital payments for GP, you know, into primary care to improve GP um, estate. I think it's largely those things. I, I, I thought it was GP estate, but I didn't yeah. realise it might be accommodation for no, people with learning disabilities. Like Which is why you've got sort of numbers of numbers of a house on a road and things. Story like that. that shouldn't be buried in a thing about we've entered the, li the vast. Anyway. The vast majority okay. is buying houses. Yeah. For people to get out of inpatient settings. Terrific. And, and presumably the seal is no longer made of wax. Um, <laughs> made <of wax. laughs> Would you like us to go back? To, uh... <laughs> okay, I'm going to move us quickly on from our medieval sealing processes to. Um, can we go to the um, item ten, um, Emily? I think you're down um, for this. I just again, it's the an, it's an annual assurance report, essentially on our emergency preparedness um, and response capabilities. Um, uh, if we look at the paper, Emily, are there any particular points that you would draw out for the board? The board is simply asked to note the content of the report and the annual assurance that we are looking at our resilience. It does paint a picture of some of the incidents that have been handled over the last year um, that have emerged. Um, but actually, it's a, Emily, is there anything that you would particularly want to draw to the, the board? I mean, the, the, the main thing to draw to your attention is that it is a statutory responsibility of NHS England to execute this function and to publish a report on, on what the team has delivered this year. Um, so this, this report does that. It also looks ahead to planning for 24 25. Um, it summarises our priorities for the year ahead. I'm the accountable emergency officer. Um, and the National Director for NHS Resilience is Mike Prentice, who's um, the main author of the paper. And 
as a result of the the stretching work of the of what used to be the EPRR team, we're renaming them, or they have renamed themselves the NHS Resilience Team, which is reflected in the paper. Um, we've detailed the documents that have been published and the products produced that are already in the public domain, um, and the given the list of incidents that have been managed by the team. It's probably worth noting that we stepped down the formal COVID response on the 18th of May. Um, but as I think several people have said, we, we are clearly still in recovery. So although it's no longer a formal incident, it very much affects a lot of uh, a lot of our work and a lot of our teams. Um, we are continuing to learn from COVID. So what we learned and what the teams developed is used to coordinate incident responses. And I saw that um, up close in the management of industrial action um, that's happened since I um, have been in this role. Um, the one of the major uses of the team's time this year has, of course, been the management of continued industrial action. Yeah. Um, and I would ask the board to sort of note the contents of the report, but also obviously say thank you to the resilience team and for the very extended network of people that work with them. We see the team that is based on the sixth floor here, but obviously there are teams across NHS England and in systems that are coordinating all of this work. Very good. I mean, I, th I think it's... Uh it's a report well worth um, studying. I mean, COVID is a very recent major, major incident, actually, in terms of our ability to handle and, and, uh, and manage that. And you quite rightly draw out the fact that industrial action has um, placed us under very real um, operational um, stresses, which we've had to manage. Um, and that's re required really strong joint working, um, just to demonstrate and prove that we can remain resilient and continue to, to operate and perform in, in spite of that pressure. I did on a visit to, it references the National Ambulance Resilience Unit, and it here talks about the West Midlands Ambulance Service and actually the contract, I think it says, is given an open procurement, um, is actually going to move to the London Ambulance Service. But actually when I was up on a visit to the West Midlands Ambulance Service, actually they did show me essentially the Ambulance Resilience Unit and, and taught me through the nature of the complex incidents that they would actually have to manage. And actually they also showed me, forgive me, it was rather a boy's own trip of some of the kit and so on that enables them to deal with some of those very major incidents that, 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 you, can, that you can imagine. Um, the assurance process is really important here and it is set out in, in some detail and building up actually from local assurance through up into regional. We've got improved training, we've looked at improved guidance that you can see um, and in particular around mass casualties as a, a burns annex on a, ma a mass casualty that's been improved. We can see that pandemic diseases operating framework that has been um, developed and, are, uh, and will be published. Um, and so actually it's a really quite um, good and interesting paper, but it imagines and envisages how well the NHS can respond um, resiliently to emergency and, and, and complex incidents. So um, we shouldn't take it lightly. Uh, and as we note it, we should note actually that it's a very important capability. And going back to my loop, um, demonstrated really very significantly only a couple of years ago, actually, with COVID. But Amanda, do you want to comment further? Or? Uh, well, I think, thank you, Richard. I think you've summed it up very well. But Emily, I mean, I think this paper really does show the just that it's the sheer range of things that the team are dealing with sort of at, at, at any one time and so having industrial action as a sort of constant through the year and the ongoing impact from covid and then all of these individual incidents i think just um I, I, we said it a lot didn't we in the pandemic what an amazing job these teams did uh, and we said it a lot during industrial action but actually bringing it together I think really does um, shine a light again on the fact that it's not just those things it's the everyday things uh, that they're dealing with as well um, but I guess my question was whether or not um, in I, I can see the methodology's changed and reassuringly I think paragraph 37 it does say uh, was it 37 um, yeah, no regions reported providers are unable to respond to an emergency or a major incident. It was just whether or not we actually, on reflection, um, think that there is either more capacity that we need to be 
identifying to support this work internally um, or indeed more widely in the NHS or whether we actually think we've learned so much from how to do things really effectively over the last few years, partly uh, because you know, we've had to learn at, at pace that actually we've now got as resilient arrangements. Difficult question, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I, at the risk of sounding very boring, I think it's a both-and answer in that <laughs> I, I know... you said that before, actually. Well, I know the, the EPR... Sorry, I'm calling the EPR team. The, the resilience team um, has struggled with enabling people to have annual leave this year, for example, because they've just there's just always been... Um, I, both, as you say, the low level... I actually just opened on my email, there's six incidents that they're actually just sent me an update on today, right? So there is an ongoing level of work all of the time, and industrial action has happened so regularly, um, which requires everybody to be on board, that it's that I think it's fair to say the team's been challenged to make sure they've got the right level of resilience themselves. Um, so we do need to look at that and our arrangements for, you know, time off in lieu, et cetera. Um, I think there is an and, though, which is what we noticed in industrial action, the, the ones that started it over in December, was that the co-location of the UEC operations team and the resilience team meant that we, we had more than double the capacity kind of thing because the insights and the kind of people that those teams are both talking to and the better data collection that we've now got from systems um, has really reinforced our ability to respond. And I would imagine the same thing would be true at system or, and trust level. If we put the teams together that are managing kind of similar things in similar ways, there probably is more resilience there than we've quite spotted. But I think that takes an ability to step back and look at it. Um, and I, I noted, in, to your point, if everybody's busy all the time, you don't get the time to step back and think about, have we actually got the right people in the right place? So I think it's a good question, which I'll take back to Mike and think about what would it take to properly look at that level of resilience and see what we want to do to build it, particularly given the COVID inquiry itself is also taking quite a lot of the teams. Thank, thank you. Jane, thank did you want to come in? Or? Um, just a, a quick point. Um, thank you very much for the paper. I was particularly interested, obviously, that you've got a refresh coming through on the operating framework of yeah. pandemic diseases. I mean, it's sort of well documented that around the world, lots of operating frameworks in lots of developed countries were found wanting. Mm. So I just would sort of think it would be particularly uh, incumbent on this board to revisit that regularly, uh, even as, as it fades from memory, uh, just to make sure that we're really up to speed because, you know, as I say, there were lots of operating frameworks that hadn't been revisited regularly as it turned out. And I think that's one of the long-term functions we can perform as a board, to go back to the things that aren't front of yeah. mind. Thank you. And I, I, I'm going to bring David in for the last comment. The one um, thing I would throw into the room is you would think about um, climate and you think about heat and you think about the, our capability to operate through severe, I mean, it's very significantly different weather conditions, particularly heat, and that's in our, actually more broadly than in our hospitals, be quite helpful. I wouldn't mind knowing offline to, to what extent we are looking at and essentially forecasting or looking, not looking forward in an emotional sense, looking forward to um, changes in the climate will impact on our operational capability attaching to, to uh, attaching to climate. Actually, It'd be quite helpful to see that on a forward trajectory. Um, David, do you want to? Yeah, no. Uh, I, I was going to mention it offline, but uh, Amanda's um, uh, question raised it, and I, I, I'm not looking for an answer. And I was slightly hesitant about raising it, but um, the terrorism threat must be quite high, and the uh, yeah. realism of it, and yeah. it was. Amidst industrial action, COVID, disease, etc., the resilience of the resilient team to deal with that kind of shock has got to be uh, a part and parcel of it. And again, I'm, I'm not looking for an answer, Emily, but there's reference into the Manchester Arena is, yeah. and actually how that learning is incorporated. And I guess the alert levels be it such that. Um, that is realistic. Vin's obviously going to say something. You're going to come yeah, in. I'm just going to recite to work with this team in my substantive yeah. role as medical director. Firstly, just say they do really detailed direction reviews both immediately and then weeks and months afterwards. So it was part of the learning of the Manchester Arena bombing. Uh, so that we're putting lessons into practice all immediately. 
The second point I was just going to make is that this team is recognised internationally mm. uh, and I think um, they do learn repeatedly but also they've had a significant influence on internationally. It's one of the things the NHS is really good at. Thank you, Vin. Um, Emily, thank you very much. Um, so I think that closes the sort of formal business of the board. So let me just go on. Is there any other business anyone wants to raise? Okay, well, in that case, um, let me draw, bring the board to a close. But to thank you all, because we've been going um, from early this morning and all day um, with barely a break. So I appreciate the commitment and, and the, um, yeah, the commitment. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, and um, see you all, no doubt, very soon, either in committee or at the next board or in a, an, a, an oncoming deep dive, which we do have. So um, thank you very much.